Hello, this is Dr. Rafael Gutierrez. Today I'm going to talk about the skull and the axial skeletal system. Now there are some people who can, who will talk about the clavicle and the os coxae. I'm going to skip that and use that in the appendicular. Now before I begin, I will tell you that all the images that I am using are fair use and are available on, uh, on the labs that I actually have on the description below. The other thing I would tell you is the skeletal system is one of the most important things to learn in anatomy because everything else will revolve around the, the topic. So it's not a, a it's not a subject that you want to learn, test, and then dump it. You really want to make, make sure you maintain the knowledge. So when you go to muscles, nerves, and other systems, you can see the, how, why the naming is a certain way. I have actually... I do recommend looking at the bones, not on, not just on uh, pictures, but on a three on a three dimensional model. I have a video on a three dimensional model that I found, which was a, around twenty dollars, which I put the link to that video below. I do recommend sometimes to use if you did buy that model to use that model while you're doing this lecture, so you can see what I am talking about. Now, it is also important to know the basic directions that you find in body. And remember that everything in anatomy goes with anatomical position. So one of the things that we actually, I will start with right away is the skull. And one, the first thing you'll notice with the skull is we are looking at the anterior view, which is pretty much what you would see if you were holding a skull in front of you, looking at the nose, the mandible, the eyes. And so you actually see a lot of these different structures. I recommend using the names that are if you're learning i recommend using these names if you're in a someone else's class and they use different names obviously you should change to their names i tend to be the type of professor who as long as you use a term which is recognized by someone i'm fine with it as long as it's recognized by for instance the orthopedic group or the uh, uh the uh facial reconstruction groups as long as it's a academic group that is involved in medicine, I'm okay with that. Some people are very specific. They want a certain name. So if you're taking this to help you in other classes and you have the uh, notes and the, or the um, handouts that I actually have on the website, I would recommend if they use a different term, cross it out and use their term. Now, looking at the anterior portion of the skull, I usually tell people to look first at the bone you can see up here. Now, if you're taking a skull, you will notice that this bone is the one of the bone of the skull that is of most anterior or frontal. And so this bone here is called the frontal bone. When you are studying it, I recommend looking at the bones first. Once you know the bones and the sutures, then move on to the projections. This way you can act, use some of the stuff that is in the, that you know about the bones to help you understand the projections. So you have the frontal bone here. And you can see a line here, and if you were to cut the body along this line, it would actually give you a coronal cut. It's actually going from the top straight down to the bottom on, on a plane, and so it separates stuff from anterior from posterior. Now that cut can be called the coronal plane. It can also be called the frontal plane. I like people to know it as the coronal plane because corona means crown, and so if you can see the crown here, you have the corona. And the reason I also like you to know that is the suture here is called the coronal suture. So you have the frontal bone. Now behind it a little bit, you can see a bone that is pretty much the top portion of the bone, the skull. And anytime you hear the word parietal, it usually will be the top layer. For instance, if you have a sac around the heart, like the pericardium, which means around heart, it has two layers. It has a visceral, which is touching the organ, and the parietal, which is the layer farthest from the organ. And so this right here is the top bone, so we call it the parietal bone. As we move down, you can see a little bit of a bone here, and you can see it inside the eye socket, called the sphenoid bone. So you can actually see the frontal bone in the eye socket too, sphenoid bone here. And we, it actually is a interesting thing. I always tell people when you're looking at the skull, pinch it so you see where the bone is on different views. Uh, when it, with the anterior view, you're only gonna see it in certain areas. 
lateral view, you'll see it in different areas. But if you're pinching it, you can actually rotate the skull and see what you're looking at. Now, posterior to the sphenoid bone and inferior to the temporal bone, you can see the, the I'm sorry, uh, inferior to the parietal bone and posterior to the sphenoid bone, you see the temporal bone. And temporal refers to time. And when I, I always tell people, when I started going gray, I started getting my gray hair here on the side. So it's a side of the, the skull where your hair starts turning gray first for a lot of us. If you think of the temple, this bone is actually in the temple area. And the temporal bone is not just behind the sphenoid, but it has a projection going to this bone here called the zygomatic bone. The zygomatic bone here, the cheekbone, touches the frontal, it touches the temporal, and it touches this other bone here called the maxilla. So already you can see the frontal, the parietal, temporal, the sphenoid is right in front, the zygomatic, and the maxillary bone. Over here you have the nose, and so this, the, the bone here is called the nasal bone. And there are a lot of projections. I want you to actually pay attention to the bones first, like I said. So we can see, I, can, I have shown you most of the bones you can see frontally. You do have the lacrimal. Lacrimate means to tear up. So the lacrimal bone is where your tears come out and run off the side of your face. You also have a duct, by the way, which leads to the nose. And that's why when someone cries, especially little kids, they get the uh, bubbles coming out of their nose. You do have a, another bone here called the ethmoid, which you can barely see. And you have the jawbone, which we are going to call the mandibular bone. So pay attention to these bones. If you want, actually draw in the sutures on pictures, images, so you can actually see where the bones are when you're studying at home. Uh, if you have a skeleton, you, I would actually recommend drawing in the sutures as well. Now, there are some words that are going to help you once you have the bones in place. One of them is a type of suture, which is fixed, called a type of joint, which is fixed, which is called a suture. You also have processes. Processes are merely extensions of bones, and they have different names. For instance, if something looks like a pen, it's going to be called a styloid process. If you have a writing instrument for a tablet or computer, it's called a stylus. So if something looks like a stylus, it's a styloid process. We also have a spine, and a spine is just a spike that comes out of a bone, it's just a projection coming out. And you'll see a lot of spikes. And one of the big things I would tell you is, if you know these terms, it's not just going to help you in the axial skeletal system, but in the appendicular. You also have something called the condyle. Now, the condyle is kind of a knuckle-like projection. Usually, it's rounded. And it allows for a joint to pretty much roll on these two rounded projections. Like I said, it's not always two, but usually it is, it is paired. The other thing that's important to know is a foramen. A foramen just pretty much means a hole. So if you have a hole in the skull, it's going to be a foramen. And by the way, when you look at the skull, you'll notice, you'll understand the thing. I need it like I need another hole in my head. Then we have sutures. Sutures, I'm sorry, then we have fissures. Fissures are big slits. Like if you think of a, a fissure in a rock, it's a crack, a big crack. If you rock climb, it's a big crack you can put your hands in. So in the skull, you will have fissures. So if you have a big slit, it's a fissure. The other two words that are important to know is infra and supra. Now, if you remember, you have inferior and superior. Sometimes we use the word infra instead of inferior and supra for superior. And you'll see that in a lot of these different holes. Now, always remember your planes. So you remember I told you about cut, getting a cut here is a coronal plane. And so this is a coronal suture, which I talked about earlier. Now, once you actually did the uh, anterior, you can see that these bones are seen in different areas. For instance, you have the frontal bone here. You can see the top bone here, the parietal. You can see the sphenoid over on this side here. You can see the temporal bone is underneath the parietal, again, where you tend to go gray. And the bone of the skull that's in the back here is called the occipital bone. Again, you could see the zygomatic bone, and you could see the sphenoid, like I said, here. And you could see that there's an arch here. This arch is called the zygomatic arch, the cheek arch. And from the zygomatic arch, if you just went medial, you'd end up hitting the sphenoid bone. So you have a little cavity here that allows actually a muscle to go through. We talked about the maxilla already, so you can see it again here. 
nasal bone, you can see it here, and you can see a spine that I mentioned here, nasal spine. You can also see the lacrimal bone and duct here. This is the one, like I said, it lets tears go into your nose. You can see a little bit of the ethmoid. You can, uh, <laughs> well, I'll show the, that one later. And again, you have the mandible. So we've added one more bone that we weren't able to see before, which is the occipital. And the other thing that you can see is a projection here called the styloid process. I will talk about the processes later. Now, when you look at the bones, look at the sutures, which I'll show you in the next slide. So you have a lot of sutures. Again, I've mentioned this one before. It's called the coronal suture. You have a suture that comes here all the way back. And it tends to be a flat, flat suture in a flat area of the skull. And if you remember when we talked about basic histology, I told you about how squamous means flat. So this flat suture is called the squamous suture, and it's on the squamous portion of the skull. The fossa here, by the way, is called the temporal fossa. On the back, you have a suture that goes up here, and on the back of it, on the other opposite side, it will go down, making a L-like pattern. And so we call that the lambdoid suture. And there's one point I love to talk about. Um, a lot of professors don't really mention it. And if, if you notice, you have this H-like pattern here, or K-type pattern here. And this is the weakest part of the skull called the terion. You'll notice it's P-T-E-R-I-O-N. So it's it, you want to say paterion, but it's actually the terion. Now, think of where the bones are. If we talk about the frontal bone. It's on the frontal portion of the skull. Parietal would be the top. Occipital would be in the back. You can see that the, where the coronal suture is between the frontal and parietal, the sagittal suture uh, is actually in the middle of the skull. You'll see it later. And the lambdoid suture is going to make that L in the back of the skull. So here we can actually start seeing some of the projections. And sometimes projections are known are named for the bone they touch. So for instance, over here you have the maxilla, right? And the maxilla comes over here and it touches a frontal bone. So it's still the maxillary bone, but as it's touching the frontal on this little area here, I'll highlight it with yellow, this area here, you would call this area the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. Remember, it's a, yeah, I'm sorry, frontal process of the maxillary bone. Again, you'll notice it's the maxillary bone touching the frontal process. This part here on the side of the suture touches the zygomatic bone. So it'd be the zygomatic process of the maxillary bone. Uh, this projection here has a different name. It's actually called the alveolar process. And the reason it's alveolar is alveoli refers to air cells. And when before you're an adult, your teeth are in this area here. And as they develop, as you lose your first set of teeth and develop your second let, the second teeth come from the alveolar process and move out, leaving a hollow cavity here. The alveolar process will be hollow, so the alveolar, it, that's why it's called the alveolar process. Over here, you can actually see how the zygomatic bone touches the frontal bone. So this would be the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. Just like that, the frontal bone has a zygomatic process and a maxillary process. Remember, it's the bone is a frontal, but it touches another bone. You can see the nasal bone here, and you can see the spine here. I usually recommend making a list of all the processes, especially the ones that keep coming up for further reference. Okay, so we talked about these, and I actually would tell you to look at them and if you have a picture, color it in. If you have actually a three-dimensional skull, you can color it in and give yourself a view of what there are. So if you have the frontal bone and it has a maxillary process, it's the part where the frontal bone touches a maxilla. So it's up here, the uh, maxillary process of the frontal bone. If you have a place where the frontal bone touches the zygomatic bone here, we call it the zygomatic process of the frontal bone. Uh, you do have a, uh, not, you don't have a mandibular of the frontal bone. This you should be cross out, and I'll just put a line here. This one you don't have a mandibular process of the frontal bone, not this one. Okay, as you go to the maxillary bone, 
you can see you have the frontal process, zygomatic process, and the alveolar process, which I mentioned before. In the zygomatic bone, it touches the front, so it's the frontal process. It touches the, the maxillary, so it's a maxillary process. And it also does touch the temporal bone in that arch. So you have the temporal process of the alveolar bone. I did mention the alveolar process of the maxilla, which you can see holding the teeth here. And as you have an area where teeth come out in the mandible here, this is also known as the alveolar process. This would be the alveolar process of the maxillary bone. Now, holes are called foramen. So you can notice that you have a little hole, make it in red here, like just technically as a notch. You can see the bone here, the hole here. You can see a hole here, and you can see a hole here. Now, there is a process I didn't mention, which I'm going to point out here, which is a process at the chin. And if you think of the statue of the thinker, the thinker is resting his uh, chin on his hand. So his hand is actually touching the mental process here. If you think of a mental process thinking, if you're thinking, you might grab your chin while you're thinking. So it, when you're having mental processes, you're grabbing your mental process. As it's called the mental process, the hole you can see here and here are called the uh, mental foramen. You see this circular thing here. And when you see circles, you're going to call them orbits. So you have a hole underneath the orbit, which is going to be the infraorbital foramen. And you have a hole over the orbit called the supraorbital foramen. Now, there are some skulls that instead of having the foramen, they just have a notch. And so they will call the notch the supraorbital notch. You can see some of the uh, fissures in the eye. And there is a hole in the eye too, which I'll show you later. And so you have the supra, superior and inferior orbital fissures and the optic foramen, which you'll see later. Again, remember, I told you a styloid looks like a pen. A spine is a spike. And there is something called the mastoid. Now, the mastoid process is found in the skull, and it's very important, especially because you have a really important muscle to know called the sternocleidomastoid. It's called the mastoid because it comes to the mastoid process. You also have a coronoid, and you have coronoids in different bones, so remember it. And you have something called a ramus, which is a hand. So now, as we look at here, we know all these bones, and you can see that you have a pen-like projection here. And that pen-like projection will be your styloid process. You can see you have a big lump of bone here, and that's called your mastoid process. Mast me, technically means breast, but you can also think of it as on a boat. It has a mast, and so you can see like a boat's sail up here. You also have a spine up here, which is called the anterior nasal spine. So anything that looks like that little spike here, just a pinprick out, is a spine. I have talked about the lacrimal duct here. I mentioned the mental foramen, the superior, supra and infra orbital foramen. And you also have a hole here. Now this hole doesn't go all the way through. It does go through a little, makes, making a little cave. And that's your external acoustic meatus, acoustic for ear. And if you take your own skull and you look at where your ear canal is, the external ear canal, you go behind it and you can feel on your skull and you can feel a big lump of bone. And that big lump of bone you feel behind that is this mastoid process. In front of it, you start feeling the cheekbone, what people call it. And that's a zygomatic process of the temporal bone. And the temporal process of the zygomatic bone together is a zygomatic arch. Now, I drew in the sutures here so you can see a little better. And what you have is the orbit or the eye socket. And you can see the frontal bone up here and it's making a... a a surface for the eye here, the superior surface of the eye. You can see the maxilla here and the suture between the maxilla and zygomatic bone, zygomatic bone and how it goes inside here. And you can see the sphenoid bone over here. You can actually pinch it and see how it goes inside and it's outside of the this area here, frontal bone here again. You also see part of the palatine bone. Palatine is for the palate. And you can see the ethmoid bone a little back here. Now, the ethmoid bone will actually also be in the nasal cavity. And if you open up the skull, you'll see it in here. So it's actually, remember, it's a three-dimensional bone. And if you have an, a 
different bones, you can look at it and see where it would sit in the skull. So I mentioned the supra and infra orbital fissures, superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure here. And you can see the, a hole here called the optic canal. Like this canal goes from the eye all the way into the in, inner portion of the skull. And so you can actually see that if you have a model that has a, that hole, if you put a washer or a wire in there, you'll see how it goes into the skull. Now, if we look at the nasal cavity, we have different things. We have one bone, which is its own bone called the inferior nasal concha. Now concha means shell in Latin. So this bone looks like a shell, so it's the inferior nasal concha. You also have a middle and a superior. Now the middle and superior nasal concha are part of the ethmoid bone. And you can see part of the ethmoid bone up here too. You can see the nasal bone. And you can see where the maxilla comes in. And then you have the, hard, the rest of the hard palate, which is called the palatine bone. And you can see that there is actually a plate that goes between the two nasal cavities called, which you can see here, which is called your, actually barely, you can't see it, it's over here. Uh, it's called the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. Looking at the nasal cavity, you can see the nasal bone, the maxilla, nasal spine. You can see the inferior nasal concha, middle nasal concha, superior will be up here. And so you can't see all of it, but you can see part of the ethmoid bone here. This is a perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone. It has a joining with another bone here called the vomer. And together, the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, the vomer, and a cartilage between it, quadrate car uh, cartilage, you have the nasal septum. Anterior view of the skull. One of the things you'll notice is the same bones keep coming up. And so look at them. So the back of the skull here is the occipital bone. You can see the mastoid process more here, temporal process here. So you have the temporal bone here. You can see temporal bone here, touching the zygomatic bone. So you can see part of the zygomatic bone. You can see the maxilla here. You can see the palatine bone. And you can see part of the sphenoid bone that comes this way here. The vomer is here, palatine bone I already talked about. And so you can see a lot of the bones that we've talked about. You can see the styloid process that I mentioned. And the maxilla does have an extension touching the hard, the palatine bone. So it's called the palatine process of the maxilla. Zygomatic bone, you can all, again see the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And that's why I tell you, when you're looking at a skull, you can actually pinch it and just rotate the skull to see what bone is where. Mastoid process is important. Styloid process is really important. On the occipital bone, you have these lines in the back, and they're called the nuchal lines. You have a superior one and an inferior. Nuca means neck or collar, and so these are the lines on the collar, so they're called the nuchal lines. You do have an external occipital protuberance here, and you also have these rounded projections, and the rounded projections are your conducts. Now, the other thing you see is this big hole, and as you remember, a hole is a foramen. So the big hole, though, here is called the foramen magnum. If you remember, magnum means big. So the foramen magnum is a big hole in the skull. Now, you can see the sphenoid bone. Like I said, this is a body. And the wings come over here. This is a greater wing here. You can't see the lesser wing. You can see the pterion process here. And the pterion process has these two plates, the uh, medial and lateral. If you remember, medial means to the midline, lateral is outside. If you draw a line straight down the middle, medial plate will be closer to the medial, uh, midline, lateral will be farthest away. Same thing on the opposite side. The vomer I mentioned and the palatine does have a maxillary process. There are, again, a lot of holes. I mentioned the forum and magnum, and the reason I mentioned the forum and magnum, it helps orient yourself. You can see the big hole, right? Now, if you go to the front of the maxilla, you have a little hole in front of the front teeth. The front teeth are called the incisors. So the little hole here is called the incisive fossa or incisive canal. In the temporal bone here, you have a hole between the mastoid and the styloid process. And so we call that bone the stylomastoid foramen. If you notice, it's telling you where it's at. Stylo for styloid, mastoid for mastoid process, foramen, it's a hole. You do have a hole behind the mastoid, which is called the mastoid foramen, 
you can see between the mastoid process and the zygomatic arch a hole here. You can see it better here. Mastoid process, zygomatic arch, hole here, and that hole is your external acoustic meatus. And you'll notice we talked about the external acoustic meatus already. You can also see another hole here. Now this hole comes through the bone into the skull, kind of, uh, I'll highlight what I mean. It starts at this hole and it goes into the skull with this path here. So it forms a canal. You also have the same canal here. And so those, that canal has your carotid artery going into it. So it's your carotid canal. Now, there are a couple other bones, a couple other holes that I actually want you to see. And these holes are known for their shape. And the first two I would tell you to look at is this hole here. Use a pointer. And the little hole here. This hole has an oval shape. And if you can see the hole with an oval shape, you know that that hole is called the foramen ovale. Next to it, just behind it, you have a spike, a hole that looks like someone put a spike through it. And that's called the foramen, foramen spinosum. Orient yourself to the skull. If you see the ovale, the one next to it, the little hole next to it is a spinosum. Look for the oval and the spinosum. In some skulls, it might be a little different, but you know the two are right next to each other. If you actually rotate your skull, sometimes you could see the, uh, well, you can see the foramen lacerum uh, here. And again, foramen magnum, you have the condylar fossa, condyle, you have a fossa uh, behind it here. And you have the hypoglossal canal, which is a hole that goes from the skull through the, pretty much under the condyle. And it's an it actually is a hole for a nerve that comes to the bite bottom of the tongue. So it's bottom means hypo, below means hypo. Anytime you see gloss, I would tell you to write that down. Me, it, gloss will mean tongue. It will come across again when you're dealing with muscles. Now we're looking at the calivaria, which means I've taken off the top part of the skull, looking inside. So you can see a lot of the bones we've talked about before. Big thing I actually want you to pay attention to is these are not different bones, there's the same bone. So if you have a three-dimensional model, pinch it and look, or, look around. Over here, you have the anterior portion. So this is your frontal bone here. Now we talked about this area here, which you can see part of a suture coming along this area here. Same thing over here. And you can see another suture here. Now, this bone is the same bone. You'll notice that it's on two layers. The part down here is the greater wing of the sphenoid, which we've talked about before. If it has a greater wing, you'll see a smaller wing here. So look at the size of this wing and look at it, not just here, but also on a skull. You'll notice a big wing and a small wing. The small wing would be the lesser wing. The big wing would be the greater wing. You can also see the body and you can see a chair-like projection here called the cella tersica. Cella technically is saddle. Tersica means Turkish, and you have a little chair uh, here called the uh, uh, Sala dorsale. Now, you can see the sphenoid, and you can see the different things that I've actually mentioned. You can also see the oval bone, the oval hole, foramen ovale, next to the spiny bone, a hole, this foramen spinosum. You also have another bone, a hole here, which is called the Foramen rotundum. Rotundum means round, and it's really a lot easier to see it on a skull. If you take the skull, look, put the anterior view farther from you, the posterior or occipital bone here, closer to you, and you drop the front slowly, the foramen rotundum will actually become available really easy. In the sphenoid bone, you also do see part of the optic canal. And again, the occipital bone, you can see the Foramen magnum. Now, this isn't the only things I would actually tell you to know in a skull. I would tell you to look at the handouts that are in the link so you can actually use more of what you actually need to see. I already talked about these. The foramen rotundum is a round hole. The foramen ovale would be the oval hole. The optic canal, you can see it over here. And so you can see all the different bones, that I've, all the different holes that I've talked about. Now, there are certain things called sinuses. Sinuses do a lot of things. One of the things is they make the skull 
lighter, so you don't need the, muscul the, the larger musculature to hold it and move it around. And the sinuses are named after the bones that they're found into. In. So if you look here, you have a sinus in the frontal bone, so it's a frontal sinus. In the ethmoid bone, the ethmoid bone is here, up here, and down here, you have the ethmoid sinus, and you have the sphenoid sinus back here. You also have a sinus in the maxilla, which is a maxillary sinus. Now there is a portion of bones that I didn't mention, which I do want to talk about, and that's in the ethmoid bone when you see it in the calavaria. You have a plate here, which is right over the nasal cavity, and it has holes going into the nose. And those are, that plate is called your cribriform plate, and you have a projection also on the ethmoid bone, which comes out like a spike here, like a rooster's comb. And so we call, we call it the uh, Christa Galli. If you think of Gala, uh, G-A-L-L -L in Spanish, it's Gallo, Gaia. It means rooster or chicken, so it's the comb of the chicken. Or if you like it as a crown, you can actually say you're going to a gala with a crown. Now we're moving on to the vertebrae. And the vertebrae are actually really important. There's a lot of things to look at at the vertebrae. And usually what I tell people is, even though it's presented from top down, I recommend studying it from the lower lumbar vertebrae and work up. You'll see why in a little. So you do have the vertebrae though. And it is made up of an area of the neck called the cervical, which is a narrowing. If you've ever heard of someone getting in a car accident and needing a C-spine, a C-brace, it's a brace, around the cervical region. You have the thoracic and you have the lumbar. And you can see as if you were in the back looking at it, you have a concave, it makes a cave, curvature at the neck, the cervical make a concave, the thoracic make a convex, and then you have a concave, another cave, concave curvature here on the lumbar. You'll also notice that the spine, if you're looking at it in an anatomical position, is relatively straight. And Everyone does have a little bit of abnormal curvature in the spine, and those abnormal curvatures are called scoliosis. Now, scoliosis will occur in a lot of people. Uh, usually it has to do with handedness. So if you're right-handed, you tend to use your right hand more, you tend to lift more, with, and so you build up muscles a different way, more on one side than the other. But sometimes it actually gets too much, and then it becomes a clinical issue, which usually needs physical therapy or even surgery. So an S-shaped spine is usually referred to as scoliosis. So if the spine goes, so the head is here and it moves in an S-shaped pattern, it's scoliosis. If we look at the thoracic region, we can sometimes get pathological fractures. A pathological fracture means that the bone isn't strong enough, so it breaks because of the weight over it. And with that, you end up having an excess curvature of the thoracic region, which is called kyphosis. And then some of us, carry a little more weight in the front. And so we can get an over curvature of the lumbar area called the lordosis, which I'll show you later. So I mentioned the cervical, neck area, thoracic, which is the thorax, the chest area, pretty technically, and the lumbar area. Now, every so often, if you actually look at CT, uh, some imaging, CT, MRIs, you'll hear it's a T12 cut. It means that if you count the ver the thoracic vertebrae, it's at the level of the 12th cervical, 12th thoracic vertebrae. L will be the lumbar, and sometimes you'll have L4, L5, which I'll talk about later. And then I mentioned you have the sacrum, which your os coccyx connects to it, and it's a major, it's a major point for mov movement, you'll see, uh, even though it is fixed itself. And the coccyx is the tailbone, which is at the end. Breaks sometimes. I mentioned the abnormal curvature, but I didn't mention the hypolordosis. Hypolordosis usually occurs when someone tries to keep their lower back too straight and actually can end up losing the curvature. And that's actually bad too. You want the normal curvature so nerves can actually pass through and not be compressed. Now, there are uh, typical vertebrae. I usually, excuse me, I usually recommend people look at the lumbar vertebrae first, but I've decided for this to use a thoracic. Now these are the typical things that are found on every vertebrae and that's why I tell you to look at the lumbar first. You have the body, which is this big lump of bone here, and it has a disc on it, 
which the vertebrae on top sits on. So you have the body, and the body is where the weight bearing of the bone actually occurs. You have processes, extension of bones coming off the side. As they're coming off the side and they make a, they can actually make a line across this, we call them a transverse process. Almost all of them, all the typical ones at least, will have a spine, just a spike coming off, just like we talked about in the skull, which we call it the spine. You also have an area here called the lamella, where it's where the spine and the, pro the transverse processes come together, where the transverse process connects with the body, it's called the pedicle. And then you have an area here which articulates with the vertebrae above it. As this is on top, we call it the superior articulate facet. We actually have the inferior articulate fat process and facet here, and they will actually meet, making a hole between the vertebrae, which will be called the intervertebral foramen. You'll also see a hole within this, which is called the vertebral form, the vertebral canal. Now, like I said, I usually tell people, look at the lumbar vertebrae first, understand all the parts, and then move away. Because once you actually have the typical vertebrae, which a lumbar seems more like a typical vertebrae than the others, you can start seeing the similarities. So you have the body, you have the spine, you have the lamella, you have a pedicle here, you have the transverse process, which is a little changed, you have the inferior and the inferior and superior articulate facets, spine again. Now the cervical vertebrae does have a spine that branches, so we call it a bifid spine. You can see the vertebral canal here. The other thing that makes it different is it has holes on the transverse process. So we call those things the transverse foramen. This here would be anterior, the spine is posterior. And so you have little tubercles here. So you have the anterior tubercle and the posterior tubercle as well. So you can see what makes this one different. The holes, the spine, and the size is different. Now there are even a typical cervical vertebrae. So that's why I usually tell you when you're studying it, look at the uh, lumbar first and then move up and look at the atypical last. Now, you, you'll notice that you do not have a body here. Instead of a body, you have these big lumps called lateral masses and you do have a superior articulate facet and inferior on it. You also have a facet here for something called the dens, which is a projection from the C2. Now, the reason you have these processes here is because Atlas holds up the world. And as far as you're concerned, at your world is your head. So as Atlas holds up your skull, it has these big projections where the condyles are gonna fit in. You'll notice you do have a transverse process and a hole in there called the transverse foramen. So you'll notice that the body is missing. You'll also notice that you do not have a spine. You have a tubercle here, anterior tubercle and posterior tubercle. And so you can see that this is a bit different. Vertebral foramen, vertebral canal. Now C2 is the axis. You have, pretty much you have seven cervical vertebrae. C1 and 2 are completely atypical. C7 has some variations, but you can usually figure it out when you look at it. Now, one of the big things you'll notice is this big tooth-like projections, which we call the dens. It can also be called the odontoid process. Now, if you think of a dens, it means tooth. So the big tooth-like projection at the top is the dens. And what ended up happening in embryology is the body of C1, the atlas, breaks off and fuses with the body of C2, the axis. Axis is a pivot point. Now your neck, the entire cervical region, allows for these pivots. So it isn't the only place that you get these pivot, but it looks like it, so you call it the axis. You do have a spinous process. Again, you can have the lamella, pedicles, transverse process, and transverse foramen. So there are different variations that you can see, but you notice that if you know the cervical, the typical cervical, you can see what's different and determine that this is the axis. Now, like I said, if you were to actually have gone from the typical vertebrae and move up, the lumbar vertebrae and move up, you'd see the body, the pedicle, the transverse process, the spinous process, inferior articulate facets here, superior articulate facets here, 
you can see the vertebral canal. And what's different here is as this bone connects to ribs, you have facets for the ribs. Now, anytime you come across the word costal, you can see the word here, costal, and here, costal, it's going to mean rib. So if you have transverse costal facets, which you can see here and here, as they, you have costal facets on the transverse process, we're going to call them transverse costal facets. On the inferior, you'll have a little divot here. And now that's the inferior portion of the thoracic vertebrae. We call that costal facet the inferior costal facet. You also do have a superior costal facet. Sometimes you'll see it written as demi facet because it's not a complete facet. The reason is the rib touches three areas. So the rib here will touch the superior costal facet of the thoracic vertebrae and the inferior costal facet of the thoracic vertebrae above it. Now, like I, always, I tell you, if you look at the lumbar vertebrae, you can see all the things that are found in every vertebrae. The biggest difference is the spine looks more like an ax. The body tends to be a lot bigger, but the bodies actually increase in size as you go from, uh, if you go from the top to bottom, the body increases. So you have the body, you have the, the pedicle, transverse process, lamina, superior articulate facet, inferior articulate facet, and the vertebral foramen, vertebral canal here. So you'll notice that you have the same thing. The difference is the spine. Now, below the lumbar, we have the coccyx. And we have the sac sacrums and the coccyx. You can see the sacrum here and the coccyx right below it. The, the sacrum is actually five fused bones, sometimes six, sometimes four, but usually five. And what you'll notice is you have these little lines here where they fused. So you can see the lines. Now, this area would be the body. And you're looking at the anterior portion, posterior portion here, and you could see where the, where the spinous process would have been. Now, it doesn't have a spinous process, it has a crest. So we call this a medial sacral crest. And where the transverse process would be, you actually have another crest called the medial sacral crest. So you have the medial sacral crest, and I'm sorry, the lateral sacral crest, and a bunch of holes, which we call the sacral foramina. We do have a sacral canal, which comes here, which is just like the vertebral canal going down. And you have an area that looks like a wing here. And so we call it the ala, A-L-A, -A, ala. In Spanish or Latin, you know it means wing. Coccyx down here. Now, we have other things. We have something called the typical rib. Now, you do have 12 ribs. You have some of them that are considered true ribs, some are false, and some are floating. True ribs connect with their own cartilage to the sternum. The false ribs share a cartilage going to the sternum, and the floating ribs don't connect to the cartilage at all. Now, if you look at this rib here, you have an area here called the sternal end, which means it's, I'm sorry, this here called the vertebral end. It's the area of the rib that connects to the vertebrae. Over here, you have the sternal end, which it's where it connect, it's going to connect to the cartilage that goes to the sternum. Now, you'll notice that you have a big rounded projection here, and so that's called your head. You also see a bump here called the tubercle. And as you have a bump and a head, you then have a bump here, a little thinning here, and another big bump here, which is going to join to the rest of the rib. And so you have the head, the tubercle, and the neck. So you can see the vertebral end, the sternal end, the head, the neck, and the tubercle. The tubercle will connect to the transverse process. You also have a groove going the length of the inferior portion of the rib called the costal groove. Always remember, in anatomy, you come across this word costal. Anytime you see costal and anything, it refers to a, as the rib. You also will notice you have an angle here. And so we call that the costal angle. Now, when we look at the sternum, we can see where the ribs come in. 
And you can see that some have their own cartilage. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven have their own cartilage. Eight also technically has its own cartilage. Nine and ten will be the false cartilage, the false ribs, and then 11 and 12 will actually just be floating. Now the ones that usually break, a lot of times people talk about breaking ribs. I know it's a floating, it's not the floating ribs that usually break. It's seven and eight. And the reason seven and eight tend to break more is because they project more, out more than the other bone, the other bones. Now there's an area you can feel on yourself, which is called the sternal angle. And you can see it in this spot right here. And it leads you to the second rib. And a lot of times, especially when you're doing stethoscope work, you find the second rib and you move down to find the space between the second and third rib. And as you have first rib here, second rib here, third rib here, that's the first intercostal space. And so the sternal angle or the angle of Lewis helps you find the second intercostal space. Now these two are both important for hearing certain valves. Now this area of the sternum is called the manubrium or the handle. You have a little projection down here called the xiphoid process. And this whole area here is the body. Now the xiphoid process is important, especially in CPR. Because in CPR, you are told to put, a lot of times you're told to find the sternal angle and that's where you want to put your hands. The reason you want to come here is if you break that xiphoid process, it can do damage to the organs inside. Now there is one more bone I'm going to talk about in the axial system and that's a hyoid bone. Now if you look at the mandible and you look at the hyoid bone, you'll notice that there are similarities to it. Developmentally, they actually develop similar. Uh, you actually have pharyngeal gill slits and the pharyngeal gill slits calcify, giving you both bones. It actually also calcifies for the bones of the ear. And what you'll see is you have a body here, and then you have two horns, one here, one here. Well, I guess two horns per side, so four horns. And so you have a big horn and a little horn. So that's a greater horn, and that's a lesser horn. So that is the typical, that is actually just the basic anatomy for the skeletal system. If you really want to know anatomy, take the labs that I offer to you free from the website I've linked. And that way you can actually study anatomy. I usually tell a lot of my students that if they're going to take anatomy, learn the bones before you show up because it will give you a heads up on everything. I hope you enjoyed the video. Have a nice day. And please remember, if you're learning the bones, do not think, okay, I learned them. I can dump them after I take the test. You will need the bones for muscles, for blood vessels, for nerves. It will be invaluable. I hope you enjoy this and have a nice day.